What I am going to talk about today, just reiterate, is value is the first line of defence in the cybersecurity ecosystem. So I aim to challenge your thinking um, beyond where we're already looking in regards to the cyber industry and what we can actually do if we just think that little bit bigger. Okay, moving forward. So, um, loose agenda. Um, I always ad lib. I will probably go in the wrong order. Um, and I'm hoping for a little bit of interaction through this process as well, so don't disappoint me. Okay, not too much of a threat then. Okay, so um, going to go through a little bit of introduction. What the problem space actually is. Um, what is value science background? And then sort of start to explore why um, it will give us so much more than the current sciences we're using to understand why people do what they do. Um, a case study as to where it's actually been applied and what the benefits were. And then a little bit as to the methodology sitting behind it and what it can mean. Okay, so a little bit of background about me. Um, I'm an ex-ballet dancer. Um, did a little bit with the TA, um, did lots of sort of training and development and then spent a lot of my working life sort of developing teams, um, which is where my real passion is. So I'm a, I'm a coach, so I am coming at it from very much the, the people space, as in getting the best out of your people so that they actually do the best for you, so that they, they don't go naughty in your systems. Um, and so the slant that I'm taking today is about your insider threat. You know, but it's the bigger picture as to what insider threat actually is. Okay, so moving forward. Okay, so the people risk space coming at it, and I'm talking about people risk, I'm not just talking about insider threat. Insider threat is actually quite a limited expression. Because when we talk about people risk, we're talking about people not being able to make good decisions on behalf of your organisation. Whereas when we talk about sort of insider threat from a cyber security perspective, we're talking about poor decisions at the point of the touch of a keystroke, which is actually too late in the decision making process. They've already gone rogue, whether that be via intent or whether it be via accident. Okay, so a lot of the statistics that I've got here were taken by the CPNI and it was a report that they did back in 2013 based on 120 individual case studies of where there had been a misdemeanor within the organisation and granted they were sort of technical incidents. And what they found was that of the 120, 76% of cases were previously reliable employees. 6% resulted from deliberate infiltra infiltration and 18% got through recurrent recruitment but unreliable from the start. So what that's fundamentally saying, and all of these case studies were in organisations where people had gone through high levels of security vetting. So they were the MOD, they were the Bank of England, but they were your large corporates who had more money to throw at this particular issue and yet they're still getting through recruitment which is a real concern. Another startling statistic of 120 of those case studies, 11% of those ins insider threats ca came from the server room. So there's something to be really looked at here because at the end of the day, we don't know who we're recruiting into our organizations and we could be recruiting insider into our very server rooms. So it's beyond technology because just because we know something do we always do it? Just because we've learned something on a training course, it doesn't mean that we're going to be able to perform in the organisation that we're working for. Okay? And the primary motivation, I'm sure you've seen sort of all the work out there, so it's about financial gain, ideology, desire for recognition, misplaced loyalty and revenge. Okay. So again, sort of uh, drawing from the work done by the CPNI. Um, you know, we, we've got the stats up there. So, from an insider threat activity, 47% came from unauthorised disclosure of sens sensitive information, 42% process corruption, facilitation of third party access, 5% physical sa sabotage and el electronic or IT sabotage as well. Now, sort of current methodologies are basically been focusing on the behaviour. You know, and, and sort of when the gentleman was talking earlier about forensics, basically observing someone after they had actually done the act. The reality is, is that's too late in the decision-making process, whether that be via intent or whether that be via accident. And neither do you know the reason for them actually doing the act, which is why forensics have got such a hard challenge, because they don't know how much resource to actually throw at that activity 
because they don't understand what the problem is, how it actually happened, and what was the intensity behind it. Because imagine if you were that sort of HR person who is now having to throw at least 300 hours of HR activity to try and find out why someone did what they did. And how often as human beings do we honestly know why we do what we do? Yeah, sadly. <laughs> Well, I certainly don't know why I do what I do, but anyway, okay. So what the methodology I'm going to sort of go through um, in a high level detail is the three types of insider thinking that lead to rogue behaviour, because that's the bit that we really want to get to. We want to get to the cause. And so sitting behind all of the decisions, you've got people who do not know right good from wrong bad and inadvertently chooses wrong bad. Now, forgive me, it is a bit wordy. Okay, but that basically means knowledge gap. Yeah, they didn't know quite what they should be doing. Okay, the other two are more disturbing. No right good from wrong bad, but will choose wrong bad regardless. So that's malicious intent. Yeah, now think about of all the technology solutions out there, how would you know whether it was malicious intent just by observing someone doing dodgy behavior? You wouldn't and then see wrong bad as actually being right good. Yeah, so that's basically your idea of where the organization needs to go is not in line with where the organization is actually going. Yeah, so that's misaligned values. Yeah, and I'm sure we've all been sort of working with people where we actually just don't share their values. We think things should be done differently. Now imagine you're an organization who actually doesn't share your values. What are you prepared to compromise in the process? Okay. Now, current methodologies are only capable of identifying one of those three to some degree, and that's knowledge gap. Yeah, so you've got all the, all the security awareness training. But the reality is, is just because you train someone and they know what they should be doing, do they always do it? Yeah. And we've got um, a bit of a tendency to think that just because someone's been on a cybersecurity course, they've ticked the box, that they're actually going to actually follow through. So we need different ways of actually doing things. Okay. So within this space, and the things sort of I, I always compare um, sort of people analytics to, so have people done, when they joined an organization, did they do psychometrics? Any sort of questionnaire to actually get through the interview process, yes or no? No? Nope. Okay. So what is common practice, and certainly sort of in your higher level vetting situations, is people are sort of having to self-report how they think they might behave in a given situation or who they think they are. Are they an extrovert? Are they an introvert? Yeah? Do they actually know sort of how to follow rules? But the reality is, as current methodologies out there get to that point, just as you do within technology, and training courses of asking the question, yeah? Do I strongly agree with something? Is it this protocol or that pro protocol? Yeah, I know what constitutes acceptable use of my computer. I do know, I do not know. Well, that's a binary answer. And if someone's actually not interested in the security of the organization, they're always gonna say, I do know. So how are you going to get to the real essence of whether someone is going to be able to be behave well in your unique organization? Okay, and that's what sort of we're here to explore, is how can you go about doing it? You know, and the other tendency is to actually whistleblow within organisations. Now, the challenge about using whistleblowing is that, first and foremost, you're actually do, sort of giving the message to your fellow colleagues that you don't trust them. So what else aren't they going to do on behalf of your organisation to drive it forward? So as a methodology, it's flawed. Yeah, so what else can we do? Okay. This is why current methods are, aren't working. I'm not saying that they're not working in every single situation, but the reality is, is that do we ever know what someone else is thinking which is going to lead to their behavior which may or may not work on the behalf of the organization? Okay, because if you think about your own decisions, yeah, there's a fa factual aspect to it, isn't it? Yeah, so you see the devil in the detail which can be objectively measured. And that's the bit as cyber security professionals you've observed is the action. So that's the bit that can be observed. The reality is, is that all of our decisions come from the intangible, intangible aspects. 
yeah? So which can be felt and known but may not be immediately expressible in reasons, facts and causes. So that's why people do what they do. Yeah? So if you think about, you know, human beings, our decisions are rooted in two elements. Our strengths as decision makers, and I know I'm reading off the screen and they always say you're not supposed to do that in presentation training courses. However, I've got some pretty diagrams too. Okay, so the ability to focus on a situation or problem, to interpret what is happening, to come to a conclusion, to translate the decision into action. The thing that you're fighting with as cybersecurity professionals is people's uniqueness. Because two people will not behave the same in any given situation. So on the back of that, how do you go about building robust systems? See the world from their own perspective. What's right for someone is not going to be right for someone else. Pay attention to some things and leave others out. And there'll be different times in all of our lives where we're able to see things differently. And our ability to perform is going to either increase or decrease based on what we see and filter as human beings. We see in different ways, using different tools, and we often see the same things differently. Yeah? Which is why we often have the conversation that we don't share people's values, is because we see the same thing differently. Which is why, you know, when Peter was talking about diversity, I like to talk about diversity of thinking, not just, you know, in the flesh that we're in and how we come, because it's actually what's behind the eyes which actually adds, adds complexity to organisations and the richness. That's where the real answers are. You know, and the more we recruit in our own image, the less likely we're going to be able to re actually resolve the problems we need to resolve. So our interpretations can differ, can collide um, with others, and they can be inaccurate. And again, that changes over a period of time. So I am going to move on here. So I'm going to draw your sort of attention to a new science, and it's, it's about 70 years old, so it's not that new, um, which actually gives us a different perspective as to how to really understand why people do what they do. Um, now, sort of, I refer to it as value science. But technically, it's called axiology. And axio is the Greek for value, and ology meaning the study of. So what this fundamentally is the study of human value and values. And, and when I mean value, it is the value that each and every one of us places on the information that we filter in order to make our decisions. So we're actually measuring behind the eyes to understand the behavior. And where this has all come from, I'm gonna, it's a little bit of history, um, but there was a gentleman called Robert Hartman who was based in National Socialist Journey, Germany between the two world wars. And he was a German Jew, so not the nicest of places to be at that moment in time. And what he observed is that an individual was able to define and organize evil. Because he'd fundamentally had lots and lots of friends and colleagues who he'd been working with, who he thought in his eyes were good people. And then suddenly they were doing awful things to each other. So he spent his life, and he got nominated for the Nobel Prize back in 73 for this piece of work, but sort of he spent his life trying to put together some form of order to moral decisions. And that's what he came up with, is a mathematical framework to actually understand how we as human beings think so that we can then predict how we're likely to behave in any given situation. And that's where we're at today. It's actually a way of actually being able to do that. So what, what he has done, he's basically moved beyond the works of the psychologists whose work is purely based on observation and trying to then reverse engineer why people did what they did, he is actually starting for a point of deduction. So all of his work is based on deductive analysis rather than inductive analysis, which our human sciences are based on. So he's really, really digging deep and he's put together a mathematical framework which works and it's repeatable and there's a universal norm which connects everybody around the world so on the back of that there is no thinking difference between age culture gender so it really means you can compare one person to another which unfortunately using uh, psychological tests and again, sort of arguably, IT is a psychological test, but granted it's on the job, you're still not understanding why people are doing what they're doing. Okay, so 
what he um, sort of realised, and he looked way, way, way back. So beyond the likes of Jung and Freud, whose work was purely based on observation, he started to look back at, at your philosophers because it was their search in life to try and understand what is good. Because what he realises, if you could define what good is in a way which was scalable and meaningful, you can then measure people against what good is to understand their capacity to live a good on the ground. Recognising the fact that everybody has a different definition for good. Okay? So what sort of he came up with is that everybody around the world bases their um, decisions on what we call the three dimensions of value. And they're here. So whenever you make a decision, you put intrinsic worth on something. So if you've got a partner, yeah, you will not necessarily be able to describe why you like them in the particular way that you do. We value things extrinsically or practically, so once we know what the problem is, how can we see how to get from A to B? And we me measure things conceptually, as in how does it fit into the rules and the structure of something. Now, each and every one of us in the room will have a different way of filtering information across those three dimensions and then deciding what behaviour we need to actually perform. By understanding that, we're now able to understand how people are likely to behave in any given situation. Because it's about the cause and effect. Okay. He also sort of um, explored the fact that as human beings, we not only look through three dimensions, but we look through two views. And this is important when it comes to understanding people's competency on the ground and whether they can perform and make decisions. So all of your decisions, is you place an empathetic value. Yeah? Do you actually value the people around you? Now, if you're in an organisation and you don't value the people around you, you may be inclined to not actually perform in the best interest of the organisation. Yeah? And that's the same for the practical element. If you don't value what you're doing, are you going to do a good job? If you don't value the purpose of the organisation that you're working in, are you actually going to fight very, very hard to get a good outcome? Or are you going to break the rules? Yeah. And so that's very much of the world aspect. So we're measuring empathy, practical judgment, and system judgment. People's capacity to perform in a good manner is actually more about their self-esteem, their role awareness, and self-direction. Because if they don't see and value who they are and what they're doing, are they going to continue to perform in a good manner? So that's what we're measuring using value science. Okay. Now, I'm just, just going to explore this a little bit with you, is that every single object has a level of intrinsic, extrinsic and systemic value. Okay. Now, I've put, I've put up here sort of three terms which are mathematically more weighted intrinsically, extrinsically or systemically. Okay. Now, sort of the process that we use is actually ranking a group of statements which are weighted either more intrinsically, extrinsically, and systemically. Blue being intrinsic, green meaning extrinsic, red meaning systemic. So actually ranking them to under understand someone's structure of thought, how they go about making their decisions, what's their priority. So who wants to play? Just, just for a minute. Who wants? Thank you. Brilliant. Okay. So, describe to me a devoted security professional. It's deadlines. Okay. So, quite an extrinsic statement. What else? What, what would a devoted security professional do? One of the regulations. So, so rules oriented. What else? awareness of the profession to colleagues and society. So that's the intrinsic value. Okay, thank you. So just in that little conversation alone, you've been able to sort of talk about one thing intrinsically, extrinsically and systemically. Yeah. Now, each and every one of us will have a slightly different focus when we make our decisions. Yeah. So, if I was asked you to rank those where you place the most value, and if I can use you again, 
we're obviously don't be swayed by the audience much um, but if I was to ask you to rank from one to three where would you place the most value and where would you place the least value Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so yeah. So if, if you were to put, um, would you put blue first, green first, or red first, or uh, green, red, blue? Blue. Blue. Followed by. Red. Uh huh. Then green. Okay. So what you've actually sort of started to do, you know, and how we go about understanding someone's thinking profile and how they go about making decisions, is that each of those statements is mathematically weighted more towards either the intrinsic or the extrinsic or the systemic. Now, expand that process out, you're now able to see in someone's decision making where their focus is, where their clarity and judgment is, and by doing that, you can start to understand how they're likely to behave in any given situation. Okay, so that's why coming at the people space and understanding someone's value and valuing process gives us far more richer insight. Because I haven't asked you a single question about yourself other than where do you place the most value. Whereas current methodologies are asking people to self-report how they think they might behave. And if you're doing a security awareness training, how do you think you're going to behave in this situation? Is it this or that? Well, that can be learned. That doesn't actually test someone's capacity to perform on the job based on the stresses that they might be facing. And that's based on your value structure. Thank you. Okay. So what you actually are measuring in value science is the five stages of the thinking process. So as human beings, we value, i.e. we decide what we need to have an opinion on. And that could be, which data am I going to steal from the organization? Yeah. Then you're evaluating the importance to you in the three dimensions. So the empathy, the people piece, the extrinsic piece, and the systemic piece. Then you're thinking what options are available to you. Then you're deciding, so that's the judgment, and then you're acting. Okay. So within value science, you're measuring all five steps of the thinking process. And yet, current technologies and current processes are only measuring the last two and a half steps of the process. Think about every single time you make a decision and how much you've actually filtered out. And yet, when we're, we're observing someone behaving, what we're observing is the final action, the final decision. So every single time you're observing someone on the network and you're seeing good behavior, that could be good behavior 20% of the time, but you've just observed good behavior, so therefore they're good all of the time. By understanding the complete thinking structure of someone, you're actually seeing all of the data. Okay. So question. Looking at the process, ask yourself this. Just because I think something, do I always act or behave on it? Think about all the people on your networks and what they might be thinking and what you don't know about. This isn't ab about measuring the content, but it is about m measuring how they're relating within the context. Yeah. So it's the hidden variables. But those hidden variables give us so much more information. It's not just about whether they're not going to perform in the best interest of your organization. It's whether they are going to perform in the best interest of the organization as well. Because this isn't just about the negative side of this. This is about growing our organizations, which gives you as security professionals another advantage to, act, you know, to show that you're adding value to the business. Because as you all know, if you've ever had to pitch for security budget, and an organization is actually sort of scaling back, the first things to go are security budgets, HR budgets, training budgets, and yet they're the thing which is going to protect your assets and grow your organization. But the challenge for security is that you can really only prove your worth once it's gone horribly wrong. Yeah, so this actually gives you a way of adding value and actually demonstrating how you can support the business moving forward. 
because security should be last, li last line of defense, not first line of defense. And I'm actually a firm believer that in actual fact, you shouldn't have to observe your employees on your network. You should be able to trust them. Yeah. So it's another way of looking at it. And I always say I'm going to be thorny and ups upset people with what I say, but that's okay. Okay. So what we're looking at sort of using value signs is sort of the cause and effect within the environment. You know, and again, this is just a, a reiteration of the previous slide, you know, in the fact that how much don't you know as to what's going on behind the scenes? You know, and it, if you think sort of if people aren't feeling valued, they don't like their jobs, so all the intrinsic, extrinsic and systemic stuff, they're feeling unengaged, they're not delivering. So, so it's not just they're going rogue against your systems. What other business processes are they not actually delivering against? And if we're focusing all of our activity on IT and technology rather than actually creating the cultures which get the best out of the people, then on the back of that, we really are asking for trouble. Okay. So again, this is touching back on the work done by, by the CPNI. Um, in the fact that sort of in all of their research, you know, this is purely observing behavior. They come with, came up with 18 traits where they saw is vulnerability. So personality traits being immaturity, low self-esteem, amoral, unethical behavior. Okay. Now, if, if you're observing a colleague, how would you know? Because that's your opinion as to whether someone's immature or not. Is your opinion as to whether someone's unethical or not. So how would you go about reporting on it? You wouldn't. So it makes it really difficult to really understand why people what they do. Whereas if we look behind the scenes at the start of the decision-making process of someone, we're able to get to 13 out of the 18. We're never going to get to the full you know, and it is fundamentally because, you know, sort of Peter, t Peter touched on sort of, you know, sort of individuals within our organisations who we desperately need who see things differently, but do fall onto a, a spectrum in some way, shape or form because they see things differently. Now, from a evidence of personality or sight disorders, that's really very difficult to sort of analyse. So, so we can't do that space, but there's a lot of other things that we can do with it. Okay, now what this looks like on the ground, because you're thinking, how on earth can you measure someone's thinking, um, you know, and, and how that re relates. So I touched on earlier as to sort of the idea of ranking statements and statements having mathematical values associated with the intrinsic, extrinsic and systemic of something. Yeah, an example I always use, if you take a good car, a good car means something different to each of us. And you observe three people buying a car and they're buying the same type of car, the same make of car, at the same cost. One person has bought it because they feel cool and they can go really fast and they're getting away from their parents for the first time. So that's the intrinsic reason for doing it. Someone else will buy because it's the right amount of money and it's got the right widgets and gadgets. And someone else will buy because it's an Audi and that's their rules and structure. Okay, so that's why using typical methodologies of observation, you don't know why people are doing what they're doing and in a different situation, different culture, they're going to do something different anyway. And so I firmly believe that we need to get away from recruiting succession planning based on someone's experience. Because the reality is, is just because they've done it for one organisation, there's no guarantee that they're going to be able to do it for you because they're going to be working with different people, they've got a different manager, they've got you know, different employee benefits, things which may or may not motivate them or not. So it's about understanding the individual. Okay. So this little bit of a case study is that what we're able to do with value science is actually define what good looks like for an organisation. Because the challenge that we have is that we all use the same language but mean different things. An example I use, so if you take sort of 20 of the world's largest banks and they all have trust within their values which appear on their websites. Now trust to them, certainly at the start of the financial crisis, was delivering to the shareholder. That was where they were, had that trusting relationship. 
and yet what we all want as customers is the trust to actually sort of skew towards us. So what sort of this model actually gives us is a way of mathematically defining what those values need to be on the ground in your unique organisation, way of defining it, and then a way of measuring people's capacity to be able to deliver it. Yeah, because, you know, being able to follow rules and order within sort of the defence, yeah, or within the police is going to be very, very different, say, if you're working for um, Greenpeace and what rules and order looks like. So it's not just about using the same language, it's about understanding what that language means so that people can actually perform. So what we were able to do, and this is a bit of a case study that we did, is we actually sort of defined what good looked like for an organisation, then filtered people against that unique organisation's definition of good based on ranking some statements. This first Excel spreadsheet with all the pretty colours, so red, as you probably guessed it, means real risk. People don't have the capacity to be able to make good decisions in the way that you need them in your unique organisation against things like doing things right, attitudes towards authority, meeting schedules and deadlines, all the way through to low risk, which is the green. So we were able to profile the organisation and then at the start of that process, we were able to identify two rogue managers. One was bullying and creating a toxic culture. Now they were in position 11, so each row represents an individual's thinking. In position 11, they were the general manager and below them, that's where all the red is, they were creating a toxic culture. They were bullying their colleagues. Bullying to the point that the person in position 12, and I know you can't see the detail, but it's more about image than anything else. Person, person 12, they were able to bully them to steal and falsify their timesheets, and then they took a backhander. Now, all of that bad behaviour wasn't happening on networks, but it was still happening in the organisation, and it still cost them. And, you know, so this is a way of actually going beyond network so that you can understand good or bad behaviour and thinking leading to. So removing those two people from the organisation. Second Excel spreadsheet was seven months later. You can see obviously there's more green, but what that more green meant is that we were able to take them from a three million pound sales organisation to 18 sales pipeline within seven months and then eight months on top of that where there is more green, there's an Excel spreadsheet down here which you can't see, they were awarded 200 million pounds worth of Scottish government funding. Now I can say it, I'm a mini Scot, to get that much money out of a Scot they must have been doing something right. Okay. But they were able to get to that point by changing their culture. And the reason why the schools and the doors were quite poor on the first Excel spreadsheet is because everyone was devalued. They didn't know what their roles and responsibilities were. And that happens in every organisation because it was management which wasn't doing what it needed to do to drive the business forward. And those misdemeanours could very easily have happened on your network. Okay, so that's why sort of looking at it this way, we're able to get a lot more data analytics than by using psychological methodologies, you know, and as uh, Professor Klein, who was a professor for psychometrics over at Exeter University says, that within psych psychological assessment, there are no true zeros. So you cannot compare one person to another using observation. So as cybersecurity professionals, it makes it very difficult using those methodologies because you cannot compare one person to another because they're seeing things differently. Even if they're behaving in the same way, they've done it for different reasons. One could have done it just by pure chance and the other via malicious intent. How would you know? Okay, and so this again is sort of jumping back to my naughty people. Um, so what we were able to see in the data, now I know sort of this is a lot of detail, it won't make much sense, so it's again more about image, but if you think about all the different variables that are on here, so just for empathy alone, an individual can appear in a number of different places going from left to right. What this showed is that the manager, who was green, had similar thinking to the person that they were influencing, so that they were able to relate to them in order to get them to do something which wasn't in the best interest of the organisation. 
So by being able to look as to how thinking data and value data relates to each other, you can start to understand the relationships with people and who might be influenced and who might not be. Okay. So again, just a little bit of an example. And um, so obviously we're all aware of Snowden. What this actually sort of, sort of touches on again, so I've talked about how everybody has a different definition. So if you take the NSA, their definition of moral code, because what Hartman has given us is a way to put mathematics to a moral definition. So if you think about moral code, and all of us would like to think that we are people with morals, everybody's got a different definition of it and how they might express it. So within the NSA, Moral code means systemically respect for company rules and regulations. So if you think about all of your organizations and how security professionals are operating, that's kind of the definition that you're working with. So measures the potential for identifying value in rules, codes, and authority for maintaining consistency and honesty in decisions. With a little bit of extrinsic value, respect for company property, so not going to physically steal the crown jewels, measures the ability to identify the potential for respecting and protecting company property. Snowden's definition was on the intrinsic value. Sense of inner responsibility. He felt it was the right thing, whether we agree with it or not as something else entirely. So measures the ability to clearly identify principles and codes for making ethical and honest decisions. So what value science gives us is a way of defining what that good looks like so that you can understand everybody's capacity to be able to deliver against it, knowing that the NSA is going to have a different definition to our defence industry is going to have a different definition to Waitrose. Everybody has got a different idea. And whilst we're constantly trying to measure people subjectively through observation, how can we get our organisations moving in the same direction? Can't. Okay. So, again, just a little bit of fun. How you can go about defining sort of what the rules and order of an organization is. Because organizations are underpinned by nine values. So trust, team synergy, vision and mission. And there's a way that you can define that so you can get everybody moving forward. So I've just got here the responsibility and integrity for, um, form. If you think about sort of your role as cybersecurity professionals, you, you could describe responsibility and integrity by each of those sentences. Now, I'm not going to read out all of them, but the ones I've highlighted specifically for you guys is must pay attention to doing the right thing, must pay attention to standards and codes of conduct. That's what responsibility and integrity probably means to you as a cohort. And yet, if you bring your director who's in charge of innovation or your sales director or your CEO, they've got a different definition. You know, and this is why it's very difficult to do what you do because you're actually fighting against people who are trying to grow the organization where there aren't necessarily boundaries and rules because we don't know what the world looks like so therefore we can't have rules before the world actually exists that we're moving into. And that's the role that they're operating in. So this gives us a way of actually enabling organizations to have not only a secure culture, but also an innovative culture, which is the lifeblood of the business moving forward. So it's a way of actually pulling together all of that, because certainly my experience is that organizations at the moment seem to have um, so you've got um, a security culture initiative, you've got um, a diversity culture initiative, you've got a... And so you've got all of these different ideas, trying to pull it all off in different directions. And you've got different people within the organisation who are responsible for trying to define all these different cultures. And no common framework for actually pulling it all together so you can drive the organisation and make sure it's secure. So that's what this gives us. So again, just coming back to this, and by going through that type of a process and understanding whether people have the capacity to be able to perform on the ground, you can now see the organization's risk profile from a thinking perspective, because it's thinking that leads to the behavior, the behavior doesn't come first. 
So from a thinking perspective, what's the risk profile? And then directly link it to performance improvement. Because again, from a security prof um, profession, that's where your biggest challenge is, is actually demonstrating that it actually helps the organization grow. Okay, and I'm done. Oh, God, red. Bad, Andrea. You see, it's a good topic, this. Okay, so in regards to related capacities, um, what's, what value science gives us is a way of actually defining what good looks like for our organisation, getting right people, right seats, right values, and getting the baddies out. Okay.